Any sales, a 7.30 special, then Agatha Raisin. Later, the child in time. Log in to ABC iView and add shows to your watch list. Taking the private road to reduce state debt. The government's deal to sell off parts of Vic Roads. National property prices fall for the second month in a row as Melbourne and Sydney lead the way. The PM in Paris, working on mending Australia's fractured relationship with France. And Geelong getting ship shape for the arrival of the spirit of Tasmania. Good evening, I'm Bridget Rollison and we hope you enjoyed that retro start to ABC News. 90 years to the day after the ABC's first broadcast. But first tonight, driver's licence renewals and online testing costs will be slashed under a controversial government deal to privatise part of Vic Roads. The deal will net Victoria nearly $8 billion to help manage the state's debt. But opponents have accused the government of putting profit ahead of people. Leanne Wong reports. It's a rite of passage for all Victorian drivers and soon learners can get on the road for free. A great day for Victorian motorists, a great day for the Victorian public. As part of a 40-year partnership with a group of private super funds, Vic Roads will waive more than $50 in fees for learners to take the online test. Hazard perception and P-plate licences will also be free, saving new drivers up to $133, while drivers who don't rack up demerit points or road safety offences will get a 25% discount on their licence renewal. We think for young people, they work hard, they're trying to get into university or TAFE, uh, they're working part-time. This is $150 essentially back in their pocket. As part of the deal, the government will retain ownership of Vic Roads, while the consortium of super funds will upgrade Vic Roads' IT system and receive a cut of all registration and licensing transactions. The key for us is we do expect to see uh, an ongoing usage of vehicles, clearly. There's a, and you look at the history of registrations and licensing, it's a very stable uh, revenue stream. With the state's net debt projected to skyrocket in the next four years, it's hoped the Vic Roads deal will help Victoria claw its way back to surplus. But the government denies it's selling off the state's assets. This is not a privatisation in anybody's language. It's waddling and it's quacking. It's privatisation. The government says it will keep control of pricing for fees and services, as well as regulation and policy. But the deal has raised concerns about potential price gouging. If you look at almost any privatisation in the history of the world, it has always led to higher prices. And all you have to do is look at energy. No one would buy Vic Roads in this way unless they planned to make money from it. It would be entirely fair of the public to form the view if, in fact, uh, this was a privatisation. It's not. It's also prompted questions about giving private companies access to personal data. The data remains in Australia. We have all the safeguards there. The consortium is expected to get in the driver's seat in August. Leanne Wong, ABC News, Melbourne. Victoria Police has established a new task force aimed at disrupting outlaw motorcycle gangs and organised crime networks. It'll be known as the Viper Task Force and brings together 80 officers with a range of skills. Police say will create a more hostile environment for gangs. The announcement comes less than a week after gunmen shot a former bikey gang member as he left a funeral in Melbourne's north. The gunman escaped by carjacking a vehicle. The uh, shooting that happened on Saturday um, of, of an individual uh, and the horrendous carjacking, we won't tolerate that. We're throwing huge resources in that. I'm very confident we will resolve that shooting um, and that carjacking. The Chief Commissioner says the new task force can be quickly deployed to incidents anywhere in the state. 
Anthony Albanese will soon meet the French president in Paris as both leaders seek to repair a damaged diplomatic relationship. France was furious when Australia cancelled a $90 billion submarine contract, prompting Emmanuel Macron to accuse Scott Morrison of lying. But the current Prime Minister is intent on a reset, telling business leaders this nation can be trusted to keep its word and act on climate change. From Paris, here's our political editor, Andrew Proben. In Paris, Anthony Albanese finds a French connection. G'day. An old political foe, former finance minister Matthias Cormann. Now secretary general of the powerful OECD Economic Forum. Mr Cormann was once a fierce opponent of Labour's climate policies. Today he commends them like a carbon convert. The ambition, drive and determination that Prime Minister Albanese and his government is bringing to tackling climate change. Australia being seen to be an impediment to global action uh, was a handbrake on our engagement with Europe. Mr Albanese's most pressing engagement and the reason he's in Paris, this man. Do you think he lied to you? I don't think. I know. The French president accused former Prime Minister Scott Morrison of betrayal over the cancellation of a $90 billion submarine contract. What I want to do, though, is to make sure that we can look forward. Look forward in a way that builds a relationship to what it should be. Emmanuel Macron's the senior player in European politics. Anthony Albanese's the new guy on the block, even if some political tactics are ageless. Dodging repeated questions as to whether he'll be apologising to Mr Macron. Our private discussions uh, will, will stay private. Mr Albanese needs the French president on side to revive free trade negotiations with the European Union. And he's courting business leaders. And there have been some difficulties, and I have resolved those difficulties. War in Europe also unifying two nations once at odds. Russia's war in Ukraine is a major strategic error. Russian forces have now abandoned a strategic Black Sea outpost, Snake Island. Images released by Ukraine's military show buildings on fire, and NATO leaders are claiming a major victory. Russia has had to cede ground. In the end, it will prove impossible for Putin to hold down a country that will not accept his rule. The blow-up between Emmanuel Macron and Scott Morrison was one of the most spectacular spats in Australian diplomacy. But with Russia and China jointly challenging the democratic world, Australia and France know the public squabble over the subs deal had to end. That's not to say the French won't be seeking some advantage above and beyond the compensation already paid. Andrew Probin, ABC News, Paris. Specialist engineering teams will soon head to the Pacific to assess problems with Australian-made patrol boats gifted to its island neighbours. The West Australian shipbuilder Austal has agreed to pay the costs of repairing the defects, but the Albanese government's described the coalition's handling of the defence program as a disgrace. Here's defence correspondent Andrew Green. Austal has built a well-earned reputation as the Australian shipbuilder. West Australian based, Austal not only builds ships for Australia's Navy, it's now expanded to operations across the world. At Austal USA, we're building the fleet of tomorrow today. Since 2018, the shipbuilders delivered 15 of its Guardian class patrol boats to a dozen Pacific nations, including Samoa, Fiji, and Papua New Guinea. Now, Defence has revealed a string of defects with the 40-metre vessels, including problems with cracking and a potential fault with the exhaust system. Australia's neighbours who operate them have been given formal advice on how to do so while minimising safety risks. We're going to work through a program now of making sure that we fix them because they're critical boats for our Pacific partners. Some of the concerns were discovered as far back as early last year. The Albanese easy governments accusing its predecessors of keeping the situation hidden and unresolved. The fact that the former government was sending broken boats out to the Pacific is a disgrace. Last year, the ABC revealed another Austal patrol boat program had been delayed due to faulty aluminium imported from China. 
Austal has accepted responsibility for the defects on the Guardian class patrol boats and has agreed to pay the costs of fixing the design flaws. Soon teams from the company and defence will head to the Pacific to assess the problems and advise on temporary solutions. And while the flaws are worked through, Australia's hoping another much larger strategic competitor doesn't offer to step in to help fill the gap. Andrew Green, ABC News, Canberra. Construction of the new Spirit of Tasmania ferry terminal will be finished in time for the first sailing later this year. The $135 million project is underway at a 12-hectare site in Karayo Key, north of Geelong. It includes a new three-level boarding ramp and a 24-hour freight parking area. The facility will replace Melbourne Station Pier as the ferry's Victorian dock. The level of frustrations that we have now by not having the capacity, uh, not having the efficiencies, it would just make the whole experience so much more positive. 450,000 people coming through the area, supporting the great tourism features that we have right across Geelong and the, and the Ballerine as well, access to the Great Asian Road and, and Twelve Apostles. We're really going to look to leverage that. Sailings to and from Geelong begin on October 22nd. The downturn in the housing market is building momentum, with prices across the nation falling for the second month in a row. It's becoming harder to secure home loans as affordability bites, lenders tighten their credit criteria and fixed-term mortgage rates rise. At 3.8, once, twice, third, so there's a winner. In the nation's biggest cities, the property boom is over. I think it's a buyer's market, definitely. For this Melbourne real estate agent, that means fewer properties to sell and more cautious buyers. With interest rates rising, they have had to re-evaluate their borrowing capacity, which has meant that maybe they've dropped down a tier in their, their property searches. Across the nation, home prices fell 0.6 of a percent last month, but they're still up just over 11 percent for the year. Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart drove the monthly decline. Growth has slowed in the regions and other capital cities, but Adelaide's still recording price rises above 1%. We're expecting house prices to fall by around 15% from the peak to the trough. That sounds quite significant, but we do need to remember that house prices rose very rapidly through uh, the pandemic. Property economist Paul Ryan expects values will fall 10% in the next year. House prices are incredibly influenced by borrowing costs. So if uh, interest rates go up by one percentage point, that pushes up uh, mortgage repayments by about 10%. The expansion of the federal government's home guarantee scheme, which allows first-home buyers to purchase a property with a 5% deposit, is expected to add a little bit of heat to the market. More single parents will also be able to get a foot on the property ladder with a 2% deposit. We are so well done, well bought. In Adelaide, there's still plenty of competition for properties. In my 15 years in real estate, I've never experienced anything like the market we have seen over the past, essentially, 24 months here in Adelaide. So, obviously, it ticks a lot of the boxes. Yes. Benjamin Cardi's had to increase his budget to buy a family home. It's now right about the maximum that we can afford to get what we want. Um, so we've definitely seen the growth in the last couple of years. Another really good location. A multi-speed property market. Rihanna Whitson, ABC News. After being shut off to the world for more than two years, Solomon Islands has welcomed back international flights today. Despite the ongoing challenges of the pandemic, the island nation has found itself at the centre of a global geopolitical storm over a secretive security agreement it signed with China. Our correspondent Amy Bainbridge was on the board the first flight into Honiara. Touching down to a warm Pacific welcome. After more than two years, international arrivals are allowed into Solomon Islands without quarantine. Small business owners like Betty Akau are eager to welcome people in. My business was really affected through the um, COVID-19 due to um, no customers coming in and because of the lockdown around the world. 
Local tourism authorities are hoping visitor numbers swiftly return to pre-pandemic levels. A record 28,000 international visitors came in 2019. A packed Solomon Airlines flight IE701 was the first commercial airliner from Australia to arrive in Honiara after the lockdown. Can't wait to get home and see my families and friends. We're definitely ready. We have been anticipating this day for quite some time. Despite its isolation, Solomon Islands has made global headlines. In April, the government confirmed it had signed a confidential security agreement with China, which had been on a diplomatic blitz of the region. I just leave it for the government to deal with it. I don't have any comment on that one. The full details of the five-year agreement haven't been released publicly, but the country has confirmed that China could send police and military forces to the Pacific nation. It comes after riots last November, when locals protested the government's decision to switch diplomatic allegiance from Taiwan to China, which saw police and military assistance from other countries, including Australia, to quell protesters. Solomon Islands has opened its border just over a week before a key regional meeting, the Pacific Islands Forum in Fiji. This country's government and its agreement with China may well be in the spotlight there again. Amy Bainbridge, ABC News, Honiara. China's leader Xi Jinping has defended his political crackdown of Hong Kong, warning it can never become chaotic again. The president sworn in his new hand-picked local leader as the city marked 25 years since the British handed control back to Beijing. But having destroyed the city's political opposition, many Hong Kongers believe it's already lost its autonomy. East Asia correspondent Bill Birdles reports. A visit and a victory lap. It's been five years since China's leader last stepped foot in Hong Kong. Over that time, he's radically reshaped the city. Hong Kong's national security law has been adopted, providing the institutions and norms for upholding national security. 25 years ago, Beijing promised to maintain freedoms and pursue elections when it took the city back from British control. But Xi Jinping has crushed all of that, with laws that deem political opponents as threats to national security and traitors. Media outlets have been closed, the first steps of censorship introduced. Now most of the city's pro-democracy leaders are in jail, on bail or in exile. No people in any country or region in the world would ever allow political power to fall into the hands of foreign forces or people who don't love their country and would even sell it out. With so much pressure, it's now very hard to find pro-democracy supporters in Hong Kong willing to speak publicly. Debbie Chan, a former local councillor, says many Hong Kongers feel the only choice left is to leave. If you came to Hong Kong, actually, if you go to a restaurant or a bar, it's always like someone is following their friends and family members. So, and like the only reason why you go to the airport is because like you are sending your friends away. Adding to the city's woes, tight COVID border restrictions have crippled Hong Kong's status as a global hub. That will pose the first challenge to Xi Jinping's hand-picked new leader, John Lee. With the city transformed and the opposition gone, Xi Jinping strongly hinted that Hong Kong now has the type of system Beijing always envisioned. He said there's no reason to change it in another 25 years' time when the one country, two systems deal expires. Bill Bertels, ABC News. Guy Sebastian's former manager has avoided jail for now. Titus Day will stay out on bail while he awaits sentencing for embezzling more than $600,000 from the former Australian Idol winner. Mr Day, do you maintain your innocence? Titus Day walked into court knowing he might not come out. Mr Day, how do you spend last night? Guy Sebastian's former manager has been found guilty of embezzling more than $600,000 from the singer. What do you say to the jury's verdict? The prosecution wanted the 49-year-old put behind bars before being sentenced, telling the court there is no doubt, in fact, it's not even debatable, that Mr Day must go to jail. 
with each one of his 34 counts of guilty, carrying a maximum of 10 years in prison. But the judge extended Mr Day's bail, while noting his decision does not mean the accused will not be sentenced to full-time imprisonment, nor does it mean it is unlikely. Whilst Titus Day walked out of court today, his bail conditions have changed. He must surrender his passport and report to Waverley Police Station once a week until he's sentenced. Mr Day, what will you do between this time and sentencing? As for the Aussie pop star... He's happy to be moving on. I feel a lot of things. Vindicated is absolutely one of them. Very confused because I did try everything I possibly could to not get to this point. Titus Day's sentence hearing will commence on September 16. Cameron Gock, ABC News, Sydney. To finance now, when the local share market started the new financial year with a small fall. Here's Alan Kohler. Well, a saggy start to the new year. Banks up, offset by mining stocks falling. All ordinaries down 0.4%. And the two hairy dogs of 21-22, Cezil and Zipco, which were the worst performers last financial year, got off to a snappy start in 22-23. Cezil up 15% today and Zipco up 9%. Wall Street fell last night, which had a pretty depressing effect on the rest of the world. And by the way, the six months to June were the American share market's worst first half of the year since World War II, apart from 1962, which saw a slightly bigger fall in the first six months than this year's 20%. Now, 1962 was the Cuban Missile Crisis following the Bay of Pigs debacle in April 1961. And this year, it's partly about Russia again. And the other way in which history is rhyming is that in 1962, the Federal Reserve was also hiking US interest rates out of a recession. There were some pretty big falls on commodity markets last night because of concerns about the slowing global economy leading to less demand. And the Australian dollar eased to 68.2 US cents. And finally, a few special graphs from today's house price data for June. Now, first, although it's true that the decline in Sydney is accelerating at the moment, it's still tiny compared with the rise over the past two years. 42% it's been, or $340,000 up. Second, the decline in Sydney had been going at the same pace as the last downturn in 2017, until the first RBA rate hike on May the 5th, when it really steepened. And finally, although Melbourne and Sydney prices have rolled over and are clearly heading lower, in Adelaide and Brisbane, they're powering ahead still. So more than ever, there is no national housing market. And that's finance. Brisbane has responded to last week's heavy defeat to Melbourne by powering past the Western Bulldogs by 41 points. The home side overcame a slow start and hamstring injuries to captain Dane Zorko and important defender Daniel Rich to finish strongly with 10 goals in the second half. Explosive forward Charlie Cameron kicked four goals to inspire the Lions' fight back. In tennis, Nick Kyrgios headlines a trio of Australians through to the third round of Wimbledon. Kyrgios puts a bumpy and expensive start to the tournament behind him to dominate his Serbi Serbian opponent in straight sets. Isla Tomjanovic also enjoyed a straight sets win, while compatriot Alex Dimonor came from a set down to win his match. Two days after spitting at a spectator in a frustrated five-set match, he says was disrespectful, Nick Kyrgios left the sideshow behind him in a clinical and powerful display against 26th seed Filip Krajinovic. Oh, oh. Unbelievable shot. You know, I was kind of in my zone, just great body language, just played well. And, you know, I just wanted to remind everyone that I'm pretty good. <laughs> Kyrgios barely broke a sweat, but his 6-2, 6-3, 6-1 victory was dampened when his behaviour the previous match earned him a US $10,000 fine, including for abusing a line judge. Kyrgios will now meet Stefanos Tsitsipas after the Greek fourth seed beat Australian Jordan Thompson in straight sets. I have respect for the game, uh, for his game, the way he's able to uh, utilise his talents and uh, the way he uh, uh, really fights when he really wants to. Kyrgios was due to play his opening doubles match with Thanasi Kokonakis, but has withdrawn to focus on the singles. Isla Tomjanovic powered through her second round match. Oh, what a return. Out-muscling lower-ranked American Catherine Harrison, 6-2-6-2. The informed 29-year-old is the only Australian woman remaining in the draw.
it was harder going for compatriot Alex Dimonor. Oh, that is a beauty. Absolute beauty from Draper. The Wimbledon crowd got behind local hope Jack Draper, who claimed the first set before Dimonor fought back to win in a four-set battle. Oh, this is just ridiculous. But the Australian believed the focus should be elsewhere. Before we talk about my match, can we just talk about KT Bolter today? <laughs> I mean... Bolter, Dimonor's girlfriend, had earlier dedicated the biggest win of her career to her grandmother. My grand passed away two days ago, and I'd just like to dedicate that to her today. Bolter says she's drawn inspiration from Dimonor as she struggled through injury and illness. Tom Maddox, ABC News. A dominant display of spin bowling has helped Australia demolish Sri Lanka inside three days in the first cricket test in Gaul. The visitors added just eight runs to their overnight That's total, cool. with Sri Lanka beginning its second innings 109 cool. runs behind. Things right quickly fell apart for the home side as the Australian spinners took full advantage of the turning surface. Nathan Lyon and Travis Head both finished with four wickets, as Sri Lanka was all out for just 113, leaving Australia needing just five runs to claim the win. That's it. That's the end of it. Warner finishes it in style. Australia will celebrate a comprehensive victory for them. It was Australia's second fastest test win since 1946. Storm coach Craig Bellamy has lashed out at his team's poor defence after a 36-30 upset loss to Manly. The Storm were without the injured Cameron Munster and Manly opened the scoring when Talultau Kola pounced on this Storm grubber kick. The speedster, Kola will go the length of the field. Just making new tackles. I am mean, soft tries they scored with just going through us. You know, like at the end of the day, it's, um, that's not good enough. Trailing by 24 points at one stage, the Storm piled on a late fight back with four tries in four minutes. But it wasn't enough. Manly holding on for the win. Now with the weather, here's Paul Higgins. And indeed, Bridge, it is time for the weather now. Brought to you by the Bureau of Meteorology. This is how it would have looked. This is how it would have been introduced back in the 50s with a plain slide like this. Our graphics are a little more sophisticated these days. Out of the mountains, it dropped as low as minus one this morning in Wangaratta, Rutherglen and Warrigal. We had a few light showers or drizzle patches across southern Victoria today. Three millimetres falling at Rill on Phillip Island. The warmest place was Rutherglen, making it to 16 degrees. Freezing this morning in the Yarrow Valley, 2 at Scoresby, then a Melbourne City high of 12.5 at 1.08pm. That's one degree below the long-term average for July, and it's now back to 11. There's been a bit of rain around today in Canberra, Sydney and Brisbane, and even a few showers up in Cairns. This band of cloud from the Arafura Sea right down to the southeast Queensland has been producing some light rain. Another system, which is a trough off the coast of New South Wales, will deepen this weekend and potentially become an east coast low. But for us, light winds with that high just to the west of us and a shower or two tomorrow and Sunday south of the divide. But potentially flooding rain around Sydney with 50 to 70 millimetres tomorrow, up to 150 on Sunday. Wet in Brisbane as well. And a few showers for Canberra, cloudy in Adelaide. Hobart will be partly cloudy cloudy, sunny in Perth. Back home, another mostly cloudy day, as you can see, on and south of the ranges, with a light shower or two in the morning. Cold enough for patchy morning frost and some fog over north central and eastern areas. Then a dry and mostly sunny day across our north. 13 tomorrow across Gippsland, getting up to 15 at Albury with Donga. And a frost warning tonight for the northern country, northeast and Gippsland. Smooth sailing on the bay, a south to southeasterly wind below 10 knots. Cloudy in Melbourne tonight with a possible light shower. Tomorrow will be partly to mostly cloudy. There's a chance of light drizzle or a shower in the morning, especially in our north and west, 8 to 13 degrees and light winds. Sunday partly cloudy, 14 with a south to southeast wind. More partly cloudy weather Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, slowly getting warmer. Thursday the chance of a shower, 14, and Friday a shower, 2 and 13. But tomorrow, cool and mostly cloudy, and I kid you not, this is how that would have been depicted on the weather segment on ABV2 from beautiful Ripon Lee in the 50s bridge. Thanks, Paul. And before we go, you may have heard a familiar tune at the start of tonight's program. 
The news theme, which first started playing in the 1980s, is just one of the many that Australians have become familiar with over the decades of ABC News bulletins. As the ABC celebrates 90 years tonight, we'll leave you with more of that theme and some of the presenters and journalists who've helped tell Australian stories. Thanks for your company. Stay with us. Up next, a farewell special for 7.30 host Lee Sales. Good night. I only hope the new Darwin has that character. One of the worst disasters in the history of nuclear power. Only one brave protester dared resist the tank. It's a momentous occasion in the struggle against apartheid. And Andrew, do you know of any motive? Not so much in a landslide as an avalanche. Welcome to the program. Almost 30 years ago.